Many priests right now in this last year of scandal are discouraged, and uh, many of them are coming together and finding hope and finding fraternity. And here to discuss that phenomenon with me today is Father John Hollowell. Father Hollowell, welcome. Thank you so much, and thanks for all the, the work you're doing on this topic. It's so awesome. So you preached a sermon that went viral when the whole McCarrick story came out. A lot of people have seen that. Tell us about that. The, the, it was a homily that I gave uh, that very first weekend that followed the McCarrick story breaking. And um, it was interesting, the readings that weekend, you, pro- you might remember the, the readings were Woe to the Shepherds. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I just kind of preached on what had just broken the, the story. And uh, yeah, I've done some things, you know, online media, social evangelization, that kind of stuff, but nothing went viral like that homily did. And it just, you know, thousands of shares on Facebook. And I had no idea that was going to happen. Um, I just kind of spoke to my people, you know, from the heart and uh, tried to talk to them, you know, as their father and uh, it then to see what happened with it, you know, as it went around and, and, and was passed around. Um, was just a really powerful and a really awesome thing. And even then, you know, a couple weeks later, when the Pennsylvania report broke, we started. I started getting calls from victims in Pennsylvania, you know, and, and in fact, one of them was the uh, main kind of person that was quoted by the AP in their story. Uh, his name was Bob Corby. And he called and he was like, my, my counselor sat me down and had me watch your video and it was just great. It was the first time I'd heard somebody speak like that about this stuff. And you know, it was just kind of like we were getting called. I had, one night we had like nine Pennsylvania people call, mm-hmm. leave a message on the voicemail at my parish. You know, so I mean, it's just been just. I again, I didn't see it coming, but I'm thankful, and it's just been really humbling to see how it's been how God's used that in the midst of some of this. So, for those that didn't see or hear that homily, woe to the shepherds! Give us the give us the cliff notes version of what you said because it, it struck a struck a chord sure yeah i uh, i talked about how and i'm sure we'll probably get into this but in 2002 that was when i went into the seminary i was entering as the first scandals broke back then and um and i was telling them how i was just sharing a story how i was a seminarian in rome and we had some older priests who had visited us about in, about three or four years later so now I'm this seasoned seminarian, you know, and we're all kind of a little bit arrogant and idealistic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were really, uh, we had these older priests who were on sabbatical visiting us. And we kind of judged them, you know, because they wore khakis and stuff. And, and you know, we, they weren't like, they were worn down by their jobs as pastors for like 30 or right. 40 years. They're on sabbatical. Anyways, the last They had day, the, uh, the tab collar out in their pocket right here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 I see yeah. that in Rome all the time. Yeah. So we, you know, we were, we kind of avoided them and, 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 and looked down on them and it was just kind of, but anyways, the last day that they were with us, one of the men got up, one of the priests got up and just gave this speech where he was like, you men, you know, when, when we entered the seminary, everybody loved us. It was great. Our towns had parades for us, you know, and, but you guys ran into the building and the church is on fire and you guys have run in and we're so all of us older guys have been talking about how we're inspired by you and we admire your Kurt and we were all just like, oh, wow, A, we're really arrogant jerks, <laughs> and, you know, and then, but B, it was just this thing of like, you know, the speech that, that always has stuck with us. And so then I kind of turned So you were like, wait, I'm not getting a parade? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I kind of just turned that and, and gave that back to the people from my parishes and just said, you know, I don't blame you if you're struggling with this and if you're thinking about leaving, if it makes you question your faith, because it makes me question mine. And I said, uh, you know, but I challenge you, uh, invite you with me to run back into the building and, and let's save this place. This is our church. And, um, it's not the Cardinal's church. It's not anybody's church. It's our, all of our church. It's the church of Christ. And so, um, that was the the gist of the homily. God's, God's going to take care of the shepherds. Woe to them. Um, he's got them. He will handle the punishment. And now let's go back in and, and rebuild. Yep. Now you're the pastor of two parishes in Western Indiana, Annunciation and St. Paul's, and you're the chaplain at, uh, DePaul university. So go you're Tigers. busy. Yeah, you're busy. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And that seems, um, I, the more priests I talk to, especially in the Midwest, uh, more and more of, of the priests uh, have multiple parishes, like a two, two at a time, and a chaplaincy. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of... Um, that, that's kind of the situation, yes, in the Midwest. They're, they're smaller parishes, you know, so 250 families each. Um, but the driving back and forth in the kind of the bigger geographic area uh, makes it a challenge at times. Yeah. So uh, as a pastor, as a diocesan priest, as a chaplain, um, how has this scandal been for priests, for clergy? I, I can tell you just from doing these shows, I have had dozens, I think it's fair to say, priests contact me you know, direct messages, phone calls. And I would say in general, there's a spirit of discouragement. Uh huh. Um, they're fighters to not giving yeah. up. Right. But it's hard. And so, yeah. you know, you're, you're right there in the trenches. What's your experience for yourself and for other men, priests that you're talking with? Yeah. I, I think going back to 2002 and I think probably, I think the, the, the experience of the priests, that I know of is pretty parallels pretty well the experience of faithful Orthodox laity, you know, which was in 2002, it was very discouraging, you know, and I think we all felt a lot of shame. Um, you know, it was this, that, that idea of, of that kind of abuse had never crossed most faithful people's minds. And so when you, when you get all these reports from the Boston Globe, which thanks be to God that it all got uncovered, but I think everybody, I'm, I'm going into the seminary thinking, you know, maybe this, maybe celibacy is a problem. I, I don't know. You know, maybe Catholicism is, maybe we do have like these serious issues. I didn't know. And, and you know, and then you understand and you're just, I don't know. It was just kind of this, I guess shame is the best yeah. word to describe it. Even though I'm in the seminary, I love my faith. I want to be a priest, but I don't really, I'm like, I'm not sure how to really respond to this. And so I'm just, yeah, when you see it, when you see the dumpster fire, you think, how did this get lit? Yeah. And you're looking for answers, you're grasping and people, some people say, oh, it's celibacy and, you know, and some people say it's clericalism or some people say it's just a spirit of, of pride and authority um, being abused. And so as a lay Catholic, I'm sure as priests as well, we want the silver bullet. What is that one problem? Uh-huh. And let's blast it away and fix it. But as we're starting to see, it's it's many layers of problems. And I and yeah, absolutely. And I think what you know, I think this this revelation this summer, you know, of all the different layers which you've unpacked, and I'm sure you know we might get into some. But I mean, we started even just with McCarrick, because I mean, like that weekend for me at least, there was uh, anger, you know, like, and and I think that. I understand. So for me, it's been very two very different things, and I see that in a lot of the laity, particularly as the revelations come out. But no longer is it shame and not really sure because we had 16 years to think about it, and we kind of worked through it, and we talked through it, and we started doing things. And we, so when this stuff comes out in 2018, all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute. You know, I think part of it in 2002 was like the experts will fix this, the bishops will fix this, the yeah. cardinals will fix this. Yeah. I'll leave it alone. They've got it. You know, we're doing video programs that are going to take care of this. We're all getting trained now, all these kind of things. Well, all of a sudden in 2018, particularly because it's McCarrick, right? I mean, it's just like, wait a minute, the guys that we thought in 2002 were going to fix this are the problem. (laughs) And so now is this this realization that for me, and I think a lot of other priests that, and, and lay people like yourself and all, you know, video, it's time to go to war. Yeah. Like, that's the it, language. It's war. Yeah, it, it's war. Absolute war. You know, like this is a spiritual warfare. Uh, Our Lady of Fatima called for this. Our Lady, you know, and and it's on and we're going to fight. And, and it is like, you know, one of the things I think that I, I understand for some of the priests that it might be tempted to discourage because there's always in the face of a battle, there's always the temptation to be discouraged that the war is happening. But I'm like, for me, and I think a lot of other people, it's like, it's here, so let's go. You know, yeah. like, let's run in and let's we fight. Were, because... We were ordained for this day. That's that's right. got to be the battle cry. It's like, absolutely. We were, the Maccabees were priests. Right. Judah Maccabee, right. his father, Mattathias. These were priestly men. Yeah. And absolutely. there was sacrilege in the temple. There was an idol of Zeus. They were sacrificing pork. Right. And they said, yeah. 
who's with me? Let's fight. Let's put together an army. Let's take back the temple. Take back the altar. Take yeah. back the worship of God. It's got to be the battle cry. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, so, yeah, it's I think there's, a, you know, and then, so in the face of an authentic conflict, there's always fear. And you just have to deal with that. You just have to, you know, there's this fear about, well, you know, I might say something wrong or I might go too far. Or, you know, I always I was telling I was on a panel this past week at the Focus Seek conference about how to lead communities, college communities and students through this crisis. And I was just telling people, you know, somebody asked the question, well, you know, like, what if you go too far? Or are you afraid that you'll say I'm like, no one faults like a father in an ER when his kids are in a car wreck. No one's like, oh, man, that guy kind of like, you know, he went off the rails there. You know, no, I mean, like if you're a father and you see this stuff going on and you read the Pennsylvania grand jury report or even the Cliff Notes version of it, I mean, w are you then going to say, well, gosh, you know, but calm down? No, I mean, a father is going to. And I would even I was even telling them, I was like, if you're a priest and you don't know how to lead and, or, and run back in and lead this battle and help fight this, you need to see a spiritual director. Because you're not really a father yet. And, it's a great and, point. Yeah, I mean, it's like a great point. I understand the like the initial like day one kind of knees buckling under the, the the fear or you know where's this going to go and oh man I wish this didn't happen that that's probably the case in any kind of war you know but, but day two it's like get up let's go you know let's do this together laity and 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 clergy together I think this war you know is also like brought a lot of people together like that were like kind of bickering factions you know i, um, I certainly agree with that yeah it is but it's awesome i mean like it's like okay now this has totally revealed the two sides you know like it's it's yes. if you thought before it was kind of unclear maybe everybody's okay and well now there's a war and we know and the two sides have been really revealed and so the people that disagree on tone you know or like you know, this website over here is a little bit too rude, you know, right. or, you know, that website right. over there doesn't say it pastorally enough. And now it's like, yeah, well, they don't maybe, but yeah, we're but all they said it. Yeah. together and yeah. they, let's go. We're all on the same team and let's fight. Do you have any priest brothers who say, I just don't, I'm thinking about leaving the priesthood. I just can't, this is not what I signed up for. I can't believe it. No. They're ready um, for the fight. I think, yeah, yeah. I, th I think so. Uh, yeah, that's been my experience. I, I I haven't talked to any priests who's like, I'm thinking about hanging it up. Right. But they are discouraged. You know, there is this idea of, I can't believe it. You wouldn't believe what my lay people are saying. Yeah. Uh, some of them I, say I, attendance. Some of them say attendance is up. Some of them say attendance is down. I think it varies parish to parish, really. Yeah. Uh, and some, almost all of them say giving's down. I don't know. Yeah, it is. Yeah, for it everybody. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do think I think some priests are afraid of like what will what will happen to me. And I think some bishops are, too. Uh, I think some bishops and, and priests think, you know, I better just kind of lay low and just kind of, you know, say the party line um, and or, or not rock the boat. Uh, but I, I just think that that's not that's not an option. You know, I mean, it, it's um, w at the end of the day, I mean, like. What's going to happen if you're a parish priest, right? And you're afraid of what's going to happen to you. Like, what's the worst that can happen, right? I mean, like, well, let's talk about that. What is the worst that could happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, they can move you. You know, uh, okay. I, they move I, you out to the all, sticks. I want to say, like, my bishop's great. We have a great relationship. He's great. Um, so I'm not, you know, but I, I just tell people just for the sake of illustration. I'm like, I'm in western, I'm in western Indiana. Like, I love it out here. I, I don't ever want to leave. You know, but like. People are always, I think there's a lot of times there's a fear of like, if I speak out, you know, then I won't get the better parish or I won't get a promotion or if right. I'm a bishop, then I won't get that committee job at the USACB. Like, but at the end of the day, it's like, that stuff doesn't matter. Who, no. who cares? You the, know, the, the stakes are so low right there. Honestly, yeah, like when you look in the world, like a committee yeah. or a better parish, it's just not like John that Vianney awesome. Became, John Vianney became a saint in ours. You yeah. Know? So you don't need to be the. The, the bishop that's the head of the liturgy committee of the USCCB to be a saint, and you don't need to be the priest of a big parish to be a saint. Right? I mean, like, that's right. So stop being afraid, you know, stop waiting for, you know, the next assignment. And then, you know, I think we've chatted before on Twitter or something, you know, that that notion that 
well, I'll, I'll say something when I'm an, a, a pastor, and then, and then right. but then they don't say anything because it's like, well, I want to wait till I get a bigger parish, or, or I get my senior, and then yeah, when I'm when a I'm bishop, a se- I'll say something, yeah. and then when I'm an archbishop, I'll say something, when I'm a cardinal, I'll say something, yeah. and then yeah, then you wake up and you're you're 75 years old and you're neutered, you never did anything, you never did anything, yeah, yep. Why do you, everyone's asking the question, how did McCary get to where he was? I mean, I've talked a lot about that, interviewed people involved in the story. Um, but it's not just McCary. Right. He's not no. the only one. Uh, this seems to be something all over America. Uh, and now we're seeing over the globe of the earth, even in the walls of Vatican City. How did we get there? Does this have to do with seminary formation? Is it clericalism? Yeah. Uh, why do we see great amount of homosexuality? Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing, you know, th- there's a story that just came out in the past couple weeks uh, with child pornography with a priest. How come the, the gravity of sin and sexual perversion is being found in numbers in the Roman Catholic priesthood? Well, I, one of the pl- first places that I went to, you know, when the McCarrick story broke, it came out early on. I invite everybody to go read it. Um, I'm sure you have. It's really short. And w- what came out was that there was a sociologist, Richard Seip, who had warned, had been speaking about this since like 92. You yes. know, he was giving conferences and he's a former priest who left to get married Um and so, you know, some people, some of the Catholics that I know are like, oh, well, we can't read anything. No, read it. Hmm. Read what he said, because he's a sociologist and he still cares about the church. And you can see that in his writing. I mean, he's doing it to try and help. And he wants to fix the problem. He actually just passed away in the summer of 2018. Yeah. But so in 2016, he had given a letter to Bishop McElroy of San Diego with his findings. And uh, which really many people think has thwarted Bishop McElroy's chance to be the Archbishop of DC right? because he sat on this letter from Richard Seip. But when you read that letter, it's really clear. He, he, it's very quick and to the point. And he says, first of all, look in my sociology research, my sociologist, you know, research, I've been researching this question in interviews and my estimation based on my research is that 50% of, of clerics at any given time are not living their celibacy, their chastity, et cetera. So they're sexually active 50%. And is that is that in America or worldwide? What's his pool of data? I believe he's focusing and and doing his research in America. Yeah, that was my understanding as well. Yeah. Although he does then quote in that same letter, he quotes another sociologist who is an actual who who is still a priest, is I Father Katsi or something like that from South America, uh, South Africa, who's also a similar. He he's a priest, but he's a sociologist. He found a very similar number in his research which I'm assuming he was doing in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like there's this widespread inf- infidelity um, to one's vows or promises that yes. you make to not have sex. I think it's a, a good priest. term there. I like that you said infidelity because we, we think of that with married spouses. Right. But the priest right. has priest a fidelity. Yeah, he has a fidelity and he right. is called to chastity. Celibacy and, 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 and chat. We're all called chastity, but he's called the celibacy, and that's a kind of fidelity. Yeah, incontinence. You know, I mean, the, people get kind of tech. You get get kind of technical. Well, let's go through those terms. People get so confused on these. So we got we got celibacy, continence, and chastity. Let's just define those for people so that they can start using the right vocab. Because just like right. when you start talking about defrocked and laicization, I mean, we've done videos on that. People, there's a there's a vernacular that's not always accurate. Sure. Yeah. And so let's do those three words. So first okay. off. Uh, the three C's. Continence. Yeah, let's do yeah. continence. So continence is not having sex. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, ba- that's that's basically the straightforward. Celibacy is also pretty straightforward. Celibacy is not getting married. So you you promise celibacy as a deacon if you're getting ordained. Um, and, and so you're saying, I won't get married. Um, yeah, so you could continent. be celibate, which would be not married, and you could not be continent. Correct, yeah. You could be having... Uh, yeah. sex on the side. And so not, you'd be celibate, not but not right. continent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
So, and then the final one is chastity, which is the much, I think probably the most important one of all. And that's just, you know, the virtue of, of properly using and utilizing my sexuality within my state in life. So the church doesn't call, you know, priests to set aside their sexuality, their masculinity, uh, but instead to apply it to their vocation as a priest. And, and I am, and just as it, you know, within marriage, obviously men and women are called to apply and use their sexuality within that vocation and that state in life. Um, and so chastity is, is the, probably the most overarching one. Right. So I, as I a married like, man, am called to yeah. be chaste. Chastity. Absolutely. Can't yep. cheat on my wife. Right. Can't masturbate. Can't look at pornography. You right. as a priest are called a chastity. Right. You can't have Absolutely. sex, can't masturbate, can't look at pornography. You live a chaste life. Correct. I am not celibate. You are celibate. Right. Right. You right. are called to be continent. I am not necessarily to be continent, but we read from Paul that a, a man and a wife can choose to have a period of continence right. where they don't have relations. Yep. So that's the three C's. Those are the three C's. It's, yeah. it's a Venn diagram. They don't all overlap. Right. Right. So I think typically colloquially, and that, that gets you in trouble on Twitter because, you know, some theologian or, you know, on Twitter wants to, uh, you know, but I think usually what, when, when Sype, Richard Sype or, you know, other people are talking about, you know, so, so and so, 50% are not living celibacy. What they really mean is that, you know, 50% are not being continent. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, I think there's that, yeah, colloquially, I think we all know, right. essentially, when we say 50% of priests are yeah. not living out their celibacy, yeah. I think everybody kind of knows. Yeah, it's not 50% secretly have a wife or right. secretly exactly. married. Yeah, yeah. Secretly, yeah, married at yeah. Vegas or something. Yeah. So 50%. Now, you know, I'm sure this, this raises the question, is this a 50%, is it, oh, I stumbled? once last year or is it this weekend I'm going out with this guy and this week I'm going out with this guy and I'm actively hooking up with people on the internet you know what I mean like right how how grievous and intentional is the lack of living out the celibate vocation not having read you know all of their stuff I'm not sure that both of them give the impression in in what I have read uh, from them, which is, you know, kind of their cliff notes versions of their research, which basically says they use language, something to the effect of like at any given time, 50% of the clergy are not living out their celibacy, their continents. Uh, so right. I don't know how, what percentage of that is, you know, maybe it's all 50% are mm -hmm. in that month had and just engaged in some sort of hookup or, right if half and half or half or half some girlfriend on the side or boyfriend mm -hmm. or whatever it is, I, I don't know how that breaks down right. exactly. But to, to your original question, I think that probably in my mind, and I think you see a lot of other people yourself and I, uh, you know, many other people that are out there like, you know, chatting and talking and having a conversation about what can we be, can be done and how did this happen? I think, and Sype makes this connection in his paper to McElroy, his letter as well. He says, look, these things are related. The, the abuse of children and the situation that we see is tied to the fact that 50% of priests are, in, on, are not living out their continence. They are sexually active in some yes. way. And I think that, that, is, that, that to me, when I think about it as a, as a diocesan priest just out in the trenches, I think that, that probably is the biggest issue that there's a lot of, there's just a climate, it seems like, you know, when you look at this, there's a climate of, infidelity to my vows and so because it's so widespread it then spills over into other sexual deviancy you know whereas if you st stamp it out and do something to crack down on the 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 50 percent and say what can we be doing about this then a lot of those other things probably start to take care of themselves yeah uh, historically in the catholic church you know it's Celibacy has been held to a high standard, and to break it was, correct me if I'm wrong, usually to be removed from the clerical state. Yeah. You, I, I, I love church history. I'm not a, um, an expert in it, but you know, from what we had in the seminary and what I've read on my own, too, it seems like in those eras where the church falls into problems, most of the time it's because there's widespread infidelity in the clergy— sexually speaking, you know, that there was some of that stuff leading up to the Protestant Reformation. And, um, and then, you know, we put the seminary system in place and, 
stuff like that. So, um, but also historically, it sounds like there were there have been eras where it's been very clear that if you violated your fidelity to your vows to your promises as a priest, then there then you were done. You know, I mean, th- th- there was in a sense, you know, there was one strike and you're out type of situation. So I think we've seen both, and I, it's also very clear that when we when we've seen the bad stuff a lot of other garbage you know has fallen in its wake yep i had a very liberal priest once tell me this was before i became a catholic uh he told me that we priests and i could tell that he was liberal right off i mean i didn't know too much about catholicism but he said we priests are called to be celibate which means not to be married but doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have sexual encounters i was like what yeah. That's not what I ever heard about Catholics. But he right. said that to my face openly. And he also right. said that he had a nephew who was a priest who had gotten a woman pregnant, which was unfortunate. And I was like, my head was spinning as a Protestant to hear a Catholic yeah. say this. You must have run into one of the 50%. You know? I ran into one of the 50%. And um, yeah. that, that idea I've also has, I've heard has been repeated um, surrounding the orbit of McCarrick where they're mm-hmm. interpreting celibacy as non-heterosexual marriage. Yeah. And they're sort of minimi- minimizing their their promise mm-hmm. to the celibate state, which they made it as a deacon, or if they're in the old rite as a subdeacon, right. to live the celibate life and pray the office. And so they're interpreting it like Pharisees. Yeah, exactly. And saying all it means yeah. is I don't enter a sacramental marriage. Mm-hmm. So I'm not technically violating celibacy by having these perverse relations with another man. Right. You You're think that's abs- common still? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. there's one situation that I know of where, where some, somebody, a, a priest who has since deceased, um, and that was what he was saying, you know, and using, and, and the other, another kind of variation or piece of that is that, and again, we're getting technical, but it's the technicality that people use to get We've out. We've got to get is, technical to fight a battle, right? Yeah. yeah. So diocesan priests make what's called promises. You know, So the bishop asks me, do you promise to be? Whereas religious priests, if you join a religious order, so you become a monk or a friar or whatever, you make vows, right? right? So I've heard people say, you know, diocesan priests say, well, I only made a promise, mm. right? I didn't make a vow. Right. So right. I, Father John Hall, I actually didn't make any vows on my ordination day. Now, the, the technicality there is vow is just who's receiving it. You know, a promise is made to the bishop and his successors. The vows are made, you know, a different word because they're made to God. The idea that that you could violate it because you just made a, you know, like I think they, it's like promise, you know, in, in the lowercase p sense of the word, you know, like, well, yeah, I promise, you know. Um, right. But that's, I mean, obviously, it's, yeah, it's pharisaical people just trying to find loopholes. And, well, and the and, irony is we made baptismal vows right. at baptism, yeah. and yeah. those vows include, you know, not committing moral sins, right. keeping our baptismal garment pure until the day, right, of our death and, or and our second so, coming. And if you're so sure that all you needed to do, that all you promised was celibacy, then just go ahead and tell everyone you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Right. Why hide because, it? Because, hey, well, you know, you, you're not doing anything wrong in your mind. You know, just come out and tell everybody about your girlfriend because you just yeah. promised to be celibate. You know, they know it. We all know yeah. that I also made a promise and a commitment before God and my bishop and everyone else in the church to never have sex with anyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there is there known concubinage in the clergy? I, I once heard a priest also say that he doesn't like going to the Maundy Thursday or the Chrism Mass because he knows there are priests there who have male or female concubines, and he just doesn't didn't like the con celebration element of it because he's like, I feel like I'm I'm joined up there with them, and I was like, wow, like that means there's known concubinage in the diocese, right? Um, is that common? Like that seems crazy to me. Yeah, I think um, in talking to other priests, you know, uh, that I that I know of in our diocese and others as well, there are there are definitely, you know, when I saw the number 50 percent, I would have never guessed that it was that high. But there are people, I think, who there are known situations where everyone's just kind of like father kind of has a special friend, you know, Um, and the. 
yeah, not, nothing really happens from that. Right. And pretty much everybody kind of knows what that means. And, um, yeah, I, I think it's, I think a lot of times I, I think it's tolerated a out of cowardice, you know, mm-hmm. as, which is really kind of a lot of times at the root of a lot of this, you know, is, I, well, I don't want to, the bishop or whoever it is, you know, is the vicar for clergy is like, well, you know, I don't want, and if it's 50%, like who's ready to sack 50% of their clergy. And, and, you know, when we're trying to, everybody's already got three parishes, you know, but right. it's probably time for the, I think it's time for the Gideon approach. Like let's get 300 guys that are ready to fight and let, you know, we'll figure this out and let's get rid of the, of the people that are, you know, um, living in violation of, the, of their vows. Um, yeah. So, you know, one such bishop who actually did that was St. Anthony Mary Claret. Do you know St. Anthony Mary Claret? I've heard, I've heard of him. I didn't know about him in relation to this, but yeah. So um, apparently when he, I can't remember the diocese. I'm trying to look it up right now. And I don't see it because I wasn't prepared to talk about this. But of course, yeah. he, was, he was born in Spain. Uh, but he had some some ministry where he took a diocese and uh, there was so much concubinage that he had to suspend most of the priests. Yeah. Oh, it was Cuba. He went to Cuba. Okay. So this okay. was in 1849. And it was yeah. in, and the diocese was in disarray. Right. This was pretty right. common in the Spanish, you know, outskirts of right. the empire as the empire is failing. And so he, from what I've been told, suspended most of the priests of the diocese. Well, they had almost no priests. Let's do it. Yeah. And you know what's amazing? Yeah. He had a huge revival in Cuba. Yep. Yep. And what's also interesting is, of course, many of the priests were just done, but many of the priests humbly repented and yeah. lived pure lives and came yeah. back. And, and he, this bishop is a saint. Right. Anthony right. Mary Claret. Yeah. So it's, it's doable. And I think yeah. we sometimes we don't expect our Lord to do a miracle when we're faithful. If right. when we're faithful, like Moses, and you hold up the staff, you know, the sea might part. Right. And, you know, well, if we did that, we wouldn't have any priests. Maybe that's not true. Maybe we would have priests. Maybe we'd have more priests. In almost Maybe. every, you, you know, in every situation in the Old Testament, right? I mean, like, and even in the New Testament, it's like God, like, I want less numbers. Like, because I want it to be very clear that a miracle is happening here. So get rid of all of that garbage. Or, you know, have the guys drink out of the stream. I only want 300 warriors and we're going to go kill 10,000 people, you know, or I only want 12 apostles, you know, I only want 12 right. and, and they're going to go out and, and they're literally going to evangelize the world because yes. I want everybody to know that it's really me, you know. Right. Um, and you see like St. Francis is another example. I mean, we well, even like we mentioned earlier, the Maccabean warriors, they were a minority. Right. They weren't a huge army and yet they won. So the numbers from a practical game, perspective, you know, I these guys are costing us billions of dollars, you know, these, these, these lawsuits and all this other stuff, then like get rid of them. Billions. Right? And then you have the spiritual, obviously the spiritual side of it too, which is they're, they're living morally bankrupt lives. So we, you, you want them preaching, you know? So you have both aspects. It's beneficial just to say, we're going to go with half our crew here yeah. and not, every, you know, you might not all get mass every weekend for a while. Right. Uh, but the faith, the priests that aren't, that don't have girlfriends or boyfriends yep. and are not sexually active are going to ride the circuit and we're going to get everybody covered and yep. we're going to clean house. Yeah. There's a great book by a guy uh, named Dom Chatard who wrote The Soul of the Apostolate. Yes. You know that book? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because he says that whenever the religious superiors fail in their vocation or compromise, you yeah. see it in their apostolate. Yeah. There's a causation there. So mm-hmm. when the priest stops making his holy hour, there's an effect in the parish. Sure. When the mother superior stops using the mysteries and the rosaries just to get it done, it yep. affects the sisters below her. Yeah. And, and he spends a lot of time justifying, explaining this, you know, that there's the soul of the apostolate is, is the interior connection with Christ, our savior. And from that is an overflow of grace to those we could say inferiors, but those who are ministered to, to the right. lady or to the brothers who are under the abbot or right. the sisters under the mother superior. And I wonder what kind of severe damage has been done to the laity through the, you know, apostate Judas ministry of a guy like McCarrick or mm-hmm. Bernadine or Mahoney, mm-hmm. or, you know, let the list go, go on. 
right. the fallout is not just billions of dollars, but we're talking about souls. Yeah. It's all about the souls. This is one of the things that I've appreciated, whether you like them or not, Archbishop Vigano. Here's, yeah. my, here's my cup. Uh, Archbishop <laughs> yep. Vigano, he, he says it's all about souls. It's all about souls. It's all Absolutely. about souls. Right. And at the end of the day, when you have hundreds, thousands mm-hmm. of people who have been molested right. by priests, bishops, cardinals, we even saw some stories that came out in the past month of nuns doing mm-hmm. lesbian molestations on young girls. This right. is now coming out. Makes your head right. spin. Yeah. Um, but also just think about the doctrine. Mm-hmm. Think about yeah. these priests who are not living continents, not their fidelity, and they're in the confessional talking to teenage boys, teenage right. girls, married men, married right. women. What right. kind of horrible theology and laxity is being poured into these souls? And the suicides, right? I mean, the, the, the people that are taking their lives because of the viol- you know, of these the, the, the crimes that are committed against people. There's there's lots of stories out of Pennsylvania and other you know everywhere else. I mean that that's un. I mean you know. How, how, how do you, how do you, you know, you, there's, there's no way to even start to put like a quantity, you know, to, to one suicide, let yeah. alone all the people that, and, and then, and then the, the lives that are destroyed, you know, I mean, you guys have been just doing an aw- all those awesome interviews with James Grind, you know, and I mean, the, the, then that spills over into all their relationships. And I mean, it's just, a, it's a, it's a tsunami of filth and it it changes the world forever and we can we can the the sad thing is is i think a lot of people priests and laity sit back and will say well god will fix it right so i i'm i'm going to keep doing my thing no god has asked you to fix it right and 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 to ask you to be part of the cause of the fix (laughs) and you don't have the excuse of sitting out and, and so you can't just say, well, that person, whatever, you know, yes, it's destroying a lot of people, but God will take care of them. Right. No, he's, he's sending you to fix it. Like our Lord said, Matthew 25, you know, when I was hungry, you gave me, right. Right. you give Jesus food when you give it to the yeah. hungry. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. Absolutely. We, when we fight this battle, we're fighting it for our Lord and he's the one fighting in us. I mean... Our Lord loves instrumental causality. He wants he to does. use us. Yeah. He could, He could. like I've said this before, he could, to every single person, give them a personal apparition of himself. I say that too. Where he yeah. explains yep. the Apostles' Creed, yep. gives a personal invite to baptism, and gives you a vision of heaven. It says, right. would you like to become a Catholic? He right. could do that. He does not. He chooses not to because he wants the instrumental causality of conversion to be preaching, the good right. example of Catholics, friendships, all the instrumental causality that we, we see in the church, which brings people into communion with Christ in the Catholic church. Right. So we, we have to be the instrumental causes. Absolutely. And cooperating with that changes us and makes us into saints. I mean, that, that, that's why he leaves it to us, you know. Yeah. Um, but the sitting out or the taking the safe path is not, it's not an option. Yeah. Um, but. So you've, you've talked more about, uh, I, I follow you on Twitter, so my thoughts may not be complete, but I don't have all the tweets in front of me, but we've talked about what should be the consequences for seminarians, clergy, even high clergy, who are violating continence, violating their promise or their vow to celibacy. And uh, I've, I've done a little bit of research. I'm preparing a video that's going to go more in depth, but just looking at changes from 1917 Code of Canon Law to 1983 mm-hmm. Code of Canon Law and penalties for clergy, it seems that things have been modified and changed. Do we need to go back to some strictness, to some severity in this time to, to clean the church? What's your take on that as a priest? Yes, uh, we do. And I, and I think that for me, and again, now I'm just speaking colloquially because again, people, you know, one of canon lawyers, I love canon lawyers, but they always want to like nitpick, you know, right. Generally speaking, the Bishop can come out at any time and take your faculties away as a priest. Right. In fact, my understanding is that in the early days, you know, back in the sixties, uh, and fifties and sixties, and I guess it was that way going way even further back, 
But when you would get ordained, you wouldn't be given the faculties to preach sometimes for two or three years until you proved, A, you got some experience, and then B, you proved you could preach. You know, other than that, otherwise you had to read, you know, the church father homily of the day, which could you imagine how much conversion would happen if we were reading the church father homily of the day, as opposed to the, a lot of the stuff that's preached. Right. Um, I actually kind of like that. I know. I yeah. know. Yeah. If, like, you, if you're I don't not have a license to preach, so today you're going to hear St. John Chrysostom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Can't hear Father Hall. We'll have to yeah. settle for St. You know, yeah. Yeah, St. Gregory or something like that. Um, so the, the, the faculties to exercise your priesthood, so you, your identity has changed at ordination. You, you are sacramentally changed into mm-hmm. a priest, your character but you're not, your, your faculties come from the bishop, and he can pull those at any time, and he can give them at any time. So now he, he does have to have some kind of reason, but having a girlfriend or being sexually active is a reason. Is a reason. And so he can come in, and he doesn't need Pope Francis to justify this. He doesn't need a February conference. He doesn't need the USCCB to write a document on it. Any bishop can just come out and say, attention, 50 percenters. Uh, those right. of you that are sexually active or have a girlfriend, if I find out about it and whatever, you know, right. okay, canon lawyers go figure the process out. Right. Um, but the well, just, he doesn't the, even need a canon lawyer, as I understand it. No, no, I'm sorry. I just yeah, yeah. He just says you're suspended on the Venice. Technicalities of the bishop coming and making this talk. I'm, right. I'm right. Speaking loosely, but the the essence is, if you do this, I am removing your faculties. For the you will never have faculties as long as I am the bishop right. and you're not transferring anywhere. Yeah. And, and, and that, so you're done. So here's, here's the, uh, here's the want ads, you know, um, right. you, you can go get a job. Walmart um, has openings. Walmart has openings. They need greeters. Yeah. You love greeting people. Um, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, absolutely. yeah. And let's talk about suspension because there's people watching right now that don't know what suspended means. Yeah. Uh, so father, please, you're talking about suspending your faculties? Yeah, or like any- if you're suspended on divinis, what does that mean for a priest? You're still a priest. Right. Right. Still, but it means still- that you can't do any sacraments. Right. Right. So the bishop could could completely suspend you. He could remove your faculties and and, and so forth. But yeah, any, the basic gist of it is that if your bishop kind of... Because here's the thing, right? We are serving as priests, diocesan priests particularly... We are serving in place of the bishop. We're really, I'm saying mass out here each weekend because the bishop can't get here. Yeah, you're a franchise. I'm franchise. I yeah. work, I, my vow was to him and his successors. So he can say, I'm done with you standing in for me. You're yeah. not, sta- I, I'm with, withholding my, I'm not giving you the ability to stand in for me anymore. So, but I'm still a priest. And um, in an emergency, the church teaches actually, you know, that that, that a priest, even if, even if he's, removed from the, the uh, clerical you know, state is, is, is removed from the clerical state and, and is allowed by the Vatican to marry and all of that kind of stuff. He can still perform priestly functions. And in the case of an emergency, you know, anointing of the sick or hearing right. someone's confession at death um, at death. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's that priestly character that could ever be taken away, but the faculties and the ability to say mass, the ability to preach, those kind of things are given completely by the bishop and can be right. taken back basically at any time and given back. So, so, so the difference for, for everybody watching is suspended means you're still reckoned in the clerical state. You mm-hmm. still got to pray the divine office, right? Right. Yep. Um, you're still a priest, but you cannot publicly function. You can't go out and say mass on Sunday or on Tuesday. Can't hear confessions. Can't baptize. Can't marry. Right. It's kind of like you've been muted. Right. Exactly. Right? The TV's on, but you're muted. Yeah, but to be removed from the clerical state, which mm-hmm. is, which relates to laicization, that means you you're still a priest forever because you have the ontological character. But you don't go by father or reverend. Right. You don't wear the collar. You don't have to pray the divine office. Right? You're not allowed to. You know, you're not allowed to say at that point. If right. you're suspended, a lot of times you can still say mass privately, privately. Um, and and that, those kind of things. Um, but yeah, once you've been removed from the clerical state, which is something that the Vatican. Uh, has to sign off on, then yes, you're free to marry and that, you know, or, um, but yeah, then you also are not allowed to even celebrate mass privately or, or do any of those sort of priestly things other than, like you said, in the case of death. 
Right. And for example, you know, the great Padre Pio, where's my picture? It's moved. Oh, here it is. You know, Padre Pio, he was Pictures suspended. Pictures bi-locating. Yes, yeah, it's bi-locating. It's back over here now. He was suspended. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. under Paul VI. Mm-hmm. And he could not say a public mass. Right. And he could not hear confessions. Yep. Uh, it was unjust, but he submitted to it in obedience. And, of course, he was re- reinstated. He was restored uh, right. after investigation as a good man and ultimately as a saint. So just because someone is suspended it doesn't necessarily mean that they're excommunicate or right. that they've done something wrong, per se. It could just mean that there's an investigation. So, like you said, a bishop at any moment could yeah. say, Father so-and-so is suspended for six yeah. months while we look into mm-hmm. something. Right. And I think on the on the positive, so thanks for bringing up Padre Pio, because I think that's a, a another helpful point, too. If you're a priest and you're afraid of what's going to happen to you, um, you know, gosh, if I speak too strongly about this, you know, if I'm, I should just be quiet because I'm, something might happen to me. If you're in the right and you're following your conscience and you're speaking about this and you're working at it, and then your bishop gets mad at you for the wrong reasons and suspends you, who cares? That's on him. Right. Right. Like Padre Pio got suspended. I mean, John of the Cross was thrown in jail by his superior. So, you know, just if if, again, I have a great relationship with my archbishop and he's awesome. If he called me, though, and was like, hey, I saw that Macara homily and you're suspended. I'd be like, that's fantastic. I'll go. Where where should I go? Yeah. Where do you want me to go now? I'll go there. Right. And, you know, I'll say mass by myself. Uh, I won't have to run the parishes anymore. Uh, (laughs) Give a little break. Um, Right. You know, but yeah, so I mean, don't fear that because many of the great saints have been. Yeah. And, and for the laity watching, I mean, I, what comes to mind is Joan of Arc. Yeah. She died under the ban of excommunication. Think about that for a moment. And was exactly. sentenced to capital punishment right. by her local ordinary, a bishop. Right. right. She was excommunicated. She died under the ban of excommunication. She is a canonized saint. So I, just tell the just tell the progressives you're following your conscience. You know, like, <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, you should be actually just accompany me, conscience. accompany me yeah. with this. Yeah, I need yeah. accompaniment. Um, so I'm saying this because it's on my conscience. Yeah, know? like we said, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, even a suspension, even an excommunication doesn't necessarily. Now we need to, of course, respect ecclesiastical dignitaries and try not to live find ourselves in these situations. Right. But even in those situations. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are not in the will of God or right. that you're not fulfilling your vocation because certainly Joan of Arc was fulfilling her vocation. Certainly Absolutely. Padre Pio was fulfilling Pio. his vocation. John of the Cross. Yeah. John of the Cross, uh, who, yeah. who was in trouble with his superior and jailed and beaten. Mm-hmm. He was beaten by right. the Carmelites, yeah. by his brothers, his yeah. fr- fellow friars of the Carmelites scourged him, beat him. Um, like you guys have said, you know, Our Lady keeps saying, you know, follow your superiors. And, right. uh, you know, so, yeah, I am, but I'm not going to sit there and worry about it at the same time. If I'm doing what God's asking me to do and I feel in my heart, then you'll sleep really— uh, You'll sleep better. Uh, an honest man's uh, pillow is his peace of mind, as John Mellencamp says from Indiana. <laughs> so, right. Oh, is, is the cougar from Indiana? Cougar's from Indiana. Oh, wow, I didn't know Absolutely. that. I like yeah. the cougar all right. I wish he had kept cougar in his name. He took it out. yeah. Yeah, I might add it to my my name as a there you priest. go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we were going back to the to the that was sort of a big canon law lesson there. But the, the point you were making was uh, a bishop. Nothing stops a bishop from suspending a priest. So if Father So and So has a special friend who spends a night on the weekends at the rectory, right. I think we can all agree the bishop should call in Father So and So and say you're suspended. Right. This does yeah. not pertain to the, even if nothing is happening, does not pertain to the dignity of the priest. And I want you to tell me what's yeah. going on here. And, and I also, but I, I also think it just needs to be my, I, I feel like the thing that would, would, that will really have a huge effect and would kind of start immediately stamping some of this out is to say to everyone, you know, the priests, um, if you, if you have, if you, if you have sex, as a priest, you're done. Yeah. Like you're never going to, you're, you're not going to have faculties again. I think yeah. that that doesn't need anything else. A bishop can just say that. And that immediately changes the dynamic um, in every way. Um, 
there's some of it, you know, like some of the some of the scandal comes about because, well, a bunch of pre a, a bunch of people get compromised. A bunch of priests are all compromised. The bishop might be compromised. You know, you get all this stuff. Yeah. And and then it's like, well, I can't turn that guy in because he knows about my girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. And right. it, just, it, it needs to be thrown out there. I think that yeah. Well, Look, we're seeing if, that if that certain men it, like that. Now you're done. Right. I'm sorry, I interrupted. But we're seeing oh, certain it. men who are like that or compromised actually do get promoted to the episcopate because it saves their hides. Yes. There's a, there's there is a corruption uh, of networked priests who promote compromised cohorts right. to save themselves. That's obvious in the case of McCarrick. Obvious. It, it, I mean, Aristotle, Aquinas, both. I mean, like, you're not going to violate, you're, you're not going to be a priest and then have sex with someone. So violate your your vow, promise, et cetera, but still be good in other areas. I mean, like, right. that's a, you are essentially morally bankrupting yourself. And yeah, it, 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 so then it, it just spills out. Yeah, everywhere. a married man can't be cheating on his wife and expect just to have a great marriage right yeah it's devastating it's absolutely yeah. devastating whether it's the wife or the husband when infidelity happens to a marriage they right. usually of course they're sacramental but they usually don't survive in actuality mm -hmm. the union because it's so devastating and if that's true right. in matrimony the council of trent says that celibacy is a higher vocation right how much more so for that yeah and, and, and yeah, and it just spills, as you've already covered, but you know, it spills into the preaching. If I'm, if I've morally compromised, if I'm sexually active as a priest, you think I'm going to preach about contraception, No. you know, or call married couples to live out the, their marriage, which is super hard, you know, and, and to accompany them. Um, if I'm, you know, sexually active on the side and breaking my vow or promise, it yeah. just, it destroys the church. And so then we don't have preaching about marriage and family and contraception and all these other issues that are so important and the family crumbles and because 50 percent of our priests are compromised too it sounds like yeah do you think priests um use the example of married people perhaps what they hear in confessional um to justify their own lifestyle they said well my whole parish is contracepting so they're engaging in sexual acts that are not procreative so it's not that big a deal if I do. I, to be honest, and I'm not like trying to make myself sound better here, but like I have no idea. I I can't put myself in 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 the mind of a person who a priest that does right. that. Right. I, what depravity and and mental gymnastics they have to go through? I'm mm -hmm. not sure. The only thing that I can hazard a guess at is again. I, as I've prayed about it, thought about it, we, you know, all the, all of us, everybody's chatting and talking through solutions. I think the lack of a punishment of, of any kind of a substantial punishment, you know, people are always like, oh, well, you should just live celibacy because it's great. And I'm like, yeah, it is. But like God gave a law, like life's good, but God still gave laws, you know, cause you're going to need a backdrop to keep some people on the rails. That's and, right. uh, I, I just feel like, there are there is no real punishment right now for a priest if you get caught being sexually active with your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever it is. So that to me is the only thing that I can think of as I as I try to think about what would per push somebody. They're like, man, I'm stressed out. I got a lot of parishes, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, this one and, woman in the parish is is really nice. Shows me a lot of attention. It's a great yeah. friendship going on here, and and this is this will be good. Yeah. And, and, and or, then if or I, that, just like with if married I people, it's, it's not that, you know, you're going to seek it out per se, but yeah, we'll go out to have lunch once a week and, right. oh, we'll go on a trip together and, you know, you buy you, 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 the gymnastics you go through, you know, I mean, right. you know, you can, but you can justify it because you, and, but I do believe that like a big part of it is, is that you, at the end of the day, you're like, and if I get caught, then the bishop's going to pull me out of this stressful situation and I'm going to go away for a while and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to be an associate pastor for a while, which is way easier. There's, there's no, if you're, if you're stressed out and you're a priest and you're contemplating this, the only, the only way, the only downside right now is your own conscience. And if you can get over that, right. 
you know, there's no ecclesiastical real fear, I don't think, right now for any of that infidelity that I'm going to get in any kind of other trouble other than right. my guilty conscience. Yeah, you had said on Twitter, I think it was yesterday, the day before, that, you know, what if you told married men, hey, if you if you cheat on your wife, right, you you get to go away for six months, you don't have to deal with your family, you don't have to go to work. Right. Right. And then you come back and everything's basically back to the same. Mm -hmm. And you get an easier job because I mean, being, an easy job, yeah. being an associate pastor, you know, is usually what the rehab stint is right now. Right. You know, um, that's so much easier than being a pastor. Right. Um, so you're stressed out. I mean, that's that is the big, you know, as it is for parents. I think I mean, one of the biggest crosses of priesthood and, and being a parent is the weight and the stress, you know, of the sure. So. Man, that that's like I got a parachute here, and I get to, you know, be sexually active with this person that's that I'm attracted to. Right. So it, it's and if I don't get caught, cool. If I do get right. caught, it's not that bad. Exactly. Yeah. And everyone's going to cover for me because they don't want the Catholic Church to look bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. It it really is. Yeah. So basically, the solution that you're putting forward, and I like it, is bishops just need to be more proactive with suspensions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what, I, I, I know we've chatted, too, a little bit about seminaries. I don't know. If yeah, you... let's give you my next question is, what yeah. do we do in our seminaries? Because it seems to me that many good men are turned away. Mm -hmm. And then often, and this is not in all seminaries, because I've been around a lot of seminarians and a lot of seminaries, and I've talked to a lot of rectors. Um, but in some cases, the morally compromised are allowed to move forward in seminary, yeah. even with sexual activity in mm -hmm. seminary, go on right. to ordination with right. the knowledge of the rector. Richard Seip, who we were talking about earlier, you know, in his letter, he said, I worked in three seminaries in the 80s and 90s. And in two of them, the rector, the head of the seminary, was in a gay relationship with one of the students, or seminarians at least. So 66% of the rectors that he worked with. Now, I should also say here very clearly up front, I had a great experience in the seminary. Um, and, and my rector and everybody at, on the staff, it was a great experience. There's always struggles and, and, and difficulties over six years. I, I think the seminaries have come a long, long, long way, um, even from the 90s. Uh, but I do think that one of the things I think that I noticed in the seminary is, that, again, just thinking about it, talking through it with people like yourself, other people that care, other priests, you know, what can we do? I, just to speak, you know, again, kind of loosely here, I, I think in my mind, there's kind of two stages that every priest that you have to go to, to become an effective priest. First of all, you have to have a, a secure masculinity, right? And, and I think that you got to be a father. You got to be a father. I, I talk about it is at some point in your life, you have to have kind of the Spartan experience where you're taken away by the men of the tribe and you go through something. For me, that was football. Mm -hmm. um, you go through something and at the end of it, they tell you you're a man now. Yeah. And a lot of guys today don't have that. They don't have, they're not, what, wherever that is. Well, like that also guys, requires a, a biological father. It does. Your it mom does ways, oh, can't, yeah. she can facilitate, but your mother can't really do that for you. And, you know, apologies to single moms out there watching, you know, but I think even they realize. They'd be realize, the first to tell you. Yeah, they'd, they'd be, be the first, first to tell you that yeah. you really, and it can be done by surrogates and it could be an uncle or a grandfather or a football coach. Right. But usually it's the father who, you know, takes you for the deer hunt yeah. or, you know, facilitates your sports or whatever it is that is your passage, that is your initiation, ideally, and in most cultures, the dad is standing by. And I think, like in our parish, we have a program called Fraternus, you probably heard of it, where mm -hmm. the men of the parish mentor, and, and it's kind of a football athletics experience kind of mm -hmm. thing, where at the end, it's like, you're a man now. And, and it's, yeah. it is very, it's, 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 it's awesome. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's not Spartan, you know, right, right. Well, I, I, hands, but I, I'd like uh, to give a shout out. I'm the founder of the Troops of St. George, which is a Catholic nice. outdoor yeah. adventure, kind of like scouts. But one of the things that we've written into it is yeah. that fathers are required to be to join, to be members, and to right. attend everything with their son. Right. So no dropping off your son. That's one of our rules. 
the crazy and thing it about- has to be the father. Yeah. And what, there's two good things about this. One is the father's there to bring up a passage, you know, an initiation. Also, it protects the son. They're not going yeah. on a camp out with some other guy. Right. They're sleeping in the tent with their dad. Yeah. There's a security, there's a safety there. So uh, I also endorse Troops of St. George, great organization, mass out, you know, mass with one priests of the and all that. One of the struggles is, the, you know, I'll say in my parish, one of my parishes is in the poorest city in Indiana. And so I have about 50% who aren't, who have no father, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I think so, but absolutely, I think that's an awesome thing to get. We try to do everything we can. If, if your father's in the picture, right, you need to be a part of this for sure. Yeah. So. I, I think seminaries need to, first of all, that needs to be a real question. Has this person who's here had some kind of experience? And again, I, you know, again, we're talking about 26, 30-year-old men. But that question needs to be asked, like, do you, have you had something? And some guys, I know some guys in the seminary who, you know, didn't go up around any of that. Their father wasn't in the picture. You know, whatever. They need to know, like, the adversity that you went through. Like, some people just need to be told have had the hellish, you know, kind of tough upbringing and just need to be told by somebody that they trust, you are a man, you know? So, I mean, right. it's not necessarily like, okay, who's played sports here in the seminary? Okay, you guys are clear. <laughs> right, right, Everybody right. else are going to go play football so that you're a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, But I, I think the seminary needs to to take that seriously, that, that masculinity, particularly now that the APA has said it's a mental illness. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we need to take that. May the Lord that. strike me with that plague. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> right. exactly. Exactly. My, my, the, the seminary I went to actually had a really a, a good program where we all were encouraged to chop wood on Saturdays and deliver it to the poor and cut trees down. And it was just, it was a really good thing for something like that. But, and then, so the, the, the second, the only other piece to it in my mind, kind of looking at it simply is I think after you've had that masculine experience, you then have to learn in a seminary or elsewhere, I think how to kind of take that masculinity and, and apply it in a pastoral way or, or like in a gentler way. So you have to become a Spartan in a sense, and then you have to learn how to love, you know, it's almost like the so, football player, you know, you're like, I'm tough, I'm ready to fight and all that kind of thing. But then there has to be a little bit of that formation that's either going to come from in marriage, my wife is probably, you know, ho- hopefully going to help me learn how to be not just the tough soldier, which is going to be key, but also how to be the father. Um, or the seminary has to do that, right? Yeah. I mean, the church has to, to help me learn how to take my fighting ability as a man and, and then apply that in a pastoral way as, as a priest and a father. And I think the, the, here's the real struggle, and I'll be quiet, <laughs> but the real struggle is if you're a man and you act feminine, it's a way it looks like the same thing as the person who's gone through those two phases. You can skip both phases and just be a feminine man and look like I'm very pastoral. I listen, all that stuff, but I'm not secure in my manhood because I've never had that experience. And so therefore, I don't even know how to apply my masculinity to this. So I'm going to just do it as a woman would. So I'm going to be a female priest in a sense. Right. And so I think that's the real challenge. We need to be, as seminaries, I think we need to help people get through both of those. That's 100% correct. I, I would use the language of, you know, there's the cultivation of strength and of power and activity of the things we associate with masculinity. But the thing that's missing, and I, in, in critics of masculinity, this is this is what they're critical of, but they don't know how to say it, is you take the strength, and I'm a father of eight kids. Right. There's the strength, there's the power, there's the activity, there's being the entrepreneur, there's all that element. But then the, the pinnacle of that, and this is what you're saying, you said pastoral, I would say the word, it's the same, sacrifice. Absolutely. It's taking all the power, all the activity, mm-hmm. all of that, that we associate with masculinity, and then adding the sacrifice. So it's the chopping the wood, but it's the right. chopping the wood in winter outside so your family can be warm. For the poor, right. Or for the yeah. poor or whatever mm-hmm. it is. So it's yep. it somehow, and, and if you don't get the sacrifice, you just get macho, you just get machismo. Yep. Like how much exactly. can you bet, you know, do you right. even lift? You know, that's that. But then if you can take the strength 
Mm-hmm. And you can live a sacrifice for, if you're a priest, for your parishioners, for the people. Mm-hmm. And they see the sacrifice, the mm-hmm. late night sit call, you know, the whatever it is. Right. Um, or your children see the sacrifice in your strength. That yep. is the, the culmination of masculinity. And it's what we need to foster. And we need to actually explain it to people. Yeah. Yeah. And you're yeah. saying, hey, if you just, if you become sort of the more, you know, the one who sets the table and who serves the food, and which is all good, right? right? And does those sacrifices, but you didn't cultivate the strength and the power. Right. right. You're a man, but you're functioning as a female priest. I've never heard anyone say it that way, but I think it's right. And and and, and it's then you can't you can't be a leader of men, right? I mean, when you get to the right. parish, the men in the parish are going to know this guy is not a leader of men. He's a he's a feminized man. Right. And they're in, there's not even going to be a word said that they don't need to hear a word from you. It's just you pick it up man to man. This guy is a man or is, or it, he hasn't had that experience. And it's not a judgmental or discriminatory or anything. It's just one of those things. It's like, you know, it's in the air. You know, it's like the, the person just says you just give that off. And, and, and we need to help guys get that. You know, I'm not saying like we yeah. need to just talk about all of our priests that we don't think are that way. We need, and that's, that's another thing too. I would say if you, if you are a lay person and and your priest hasn't had that, well, he's not going back to the seminary. Um, one of the things you can do is, is, is help pull that guy in, help pull your priest in, your pastor into the Knights of Columbus, the the St. George camping trips and help as, as as a group of men, like bring him in and, and, and help him. You know, you're not going to say, Hey father, we want to help you become a man, you know, but, um, (laughs) Right. You know, you, we, we, can, we don't have to just say, we don't have to give up on those guys. We can help, help fill in sure. the blanks a little bit. Um, I think one it, of the things I would say, yeah, one ahead. of the things I would say too, this, you know, a lot of th- stuff has come up about homosexuality in the midst of all this, right? And I think that's a huge, huge issue in, in the homosexuality in the seminary. I think the biggest struggle, you know, and, and there's a great article by Dan Matson, you know, why guys like me shouldn't be priests, right? Yes. I, I did a documentary on homosexuality in the church called The Third Way. Yes. That you know, there, there's a lot of stuff out there. I, I'm very much, I understand, you know, the, the, I have talked with lots of people, work with lots of people with same sex attraction. So we have to be very clear. But I think in the seminary, it's important to notice and to know that it's very destructive to the formation process of all the guys if there's homosexuality in there. Because here's what happens, right? If you come in, and this was kind of my situation, I kind of came in as a football player. And a guy who was like all ready to chop wood, but I didn't know the first thing really about how to live that. I didn't know that phase two. And so I had, a, I had a lot of work to do on relationships, you know, and, and how to be, you know, how to be imp, imp, empathic, you know, and, and mm-hmm. how to kind of take my masculinity. So I'm, I'm reaching out and establishing friends, kind of working at that in an uncomfortable way because, you know, my friends were always like, you know, just punch each other. Um, <laughs> and so I'm working on and then, but then. So, okay, I think I'm doing it. I think I have a good friend here. I think I'm learning that. And then you find out, no, actually, he just sexually harassed me and he's, you know, seeking a gay partner. And then, mm-hmm. you know, so you had that, I had that a couple different times. Right. You know, and then as a young priest, the same thing. Which makes you want to put a wall up to protect yeah, yourself. Yeah, then you're like, okay, I t- my friends right. were all right. You just right. be a Spartan. There, You can't be relational. You can't be empathic. You just have to be the tough, drunk Right. You know, spark macho. soldier, yeah. macho. And, 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 and so that's what happened. It just really. So while there is a place, obviously, in the church, a great place for people that are wrestling with heroically sometimes and dealing with and, and trying to figure out their same sex attraction, it does have a really harmful effect when it works its way into the seminary environment. Yeah. So what is to be done? What is to be done there? You, we've talked about bishops. Let's talk about rectors. Yeah, um, I, I think that uh, that that probably just needs to be said, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and acknowledged and addressed, um, and that yeah, that that needs to be to be worked on. And I think we need to be, you know, in the seminary. There were times I went to two different seminaries. I went to Rome, which is you know the the Navy SEAL training place. So I mean, it, it was both. It was at both seminaries that I was at. Sometimes the feminized guys who haven't been through it are kind of held up as as the you know they're the best at pre stuff you know the best. I think we need to say you know I mean I think we need 
the, the rectors and the people that are on formation and bishops need to be asking those two questions. Is this guy, first of all, secure in his masculinity? Has he had that kind of experience where he's learned sacrifice, suffering, all that kind of stuff? Is he going to work out? You know, I mean, the, 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 that, that kind of. And then secondly, has he, you know, made that step and that leap to where he's able to apply that as a priest in an empathic way and in a, in a priestly way or in a fatherly way? You know, um, those two questions, I think, need to be asked by bishops and rectors and formation staff. And we need to say are we need to stop if we are. We need to stop rewarding the people who've skipped both phases and stop acting like that guy is ready to go. But people are going to say, but father, we need more priests. No, we don't. Yeah, exactly. It, it, yeah. Right, that's back to our Gideon thing, right? right? Like, let's get 300 men and we'll, we'll, we'll do yeah. the masses in the United States. And everybody, right. you know, I don't think it's that, that's not the number, you know, but I mean, hey, every parish you get a mass once a month. Um, I think a lot of people actually, I mean, this is just my own sidebar, but I, I do think a lot of people in the United States would appreciate the mass a lot more if they didn't have it every weekend. I think, certainly. I mean, we, we, it's good to go to mass as often as possible. And thanks be to God that we have it every weekend. Um, but yeah, let, I, let's figure out who's living it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's not by, we're all sinners. We're all falling right. short. I go to confession all the time. Yep. Um, but we have to say, but when you step outside the rails here and you break, you break through this barrier, you're excluding yourself now Yeah. and we're going to delineate that. Yep. So would you say the same rule applies for a seminarian? Seminarian is sexually active. He goes home on Christmas break and hooks up with his old girlfriend or has a relation with another seminarian. You're done, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. One, right. one problem that I, you know, I'm always looking inter tradition, looking at church history. I think one of the problems we have in the seminaries is we got rid of the minor orders. Mm -hmm. We got yeah. rid of the, there's initially a tonsure yeah. where they cut you a tonsure and you, you ascended up the minor orders. Right. Right. And then up to, yeah. you know, acolyte and subdeacon and then deacon. And yep. it's almost like the seminarians, we call them seminarians with a capital S, but that's not, doesn't mean anything. They're still right. laymen. Right. You know, we, yeah. get, we allow them to wear a collar sometimes at dinners and stuff, but they're still laymen. In the old days, when you joined the seminary and you got tonsured, you were yeah. a cleric, you were right. a minor cleric. Right. And you went through the, the minor orders. You start off as a porter, you know, right. an elector yeah. and exorcist and acolyte, yeah. subdeacon. And that that gave the young men sanctity. It yeah. was a sacred order. You were being, we talked about rites of passage, you were mm -hmm. being initiated progressively towards the holy priesthood. Right. Now you're just kind of a seminarian and then you become deacon and then you become priest. And that rite of passage in this sort of ladder Mm -hmm. of sacred vocation has been stripped away. I think that was a big mistake for Paul VI to take away. That's just my opinion. Well, no, I mean, to that point on a practical level, my, you know, I, I have about five or six men that uh, I've been good friends with since high school and have been huge for me, lay men. Um, and uh, so it's funny, you know, I, I, I was, I got ordained at the age of 30. So I was about, from about 24 to 30, I was in the seminary. Anyways, they're having kids, they're married, you know, going to all their weddings. I get to do the prayer, you know, before the meal at all their weddings and stuff. And they're all kind of like, I mean, they're like wanting to follow along, but they're like, what are you? You know, they're like, what's a seminarian? And I'm like, well, I take classes, you know, and right. we kind of, we, we minimized that we, we kind of turned it into a university and, and made right. it less because it was too strict, you know. And, and, but now the problem is like, right, there's no identity. So for six years, people were kind of like, what do we call you? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm at school, you know? Yeah. It's and like, it's, yeah, it's wrong no, to call it grad school because that's too yeah. secular. Uh, right. But yeah, but it is a grad school. Like in the sense that I'm in there, I'm in class with lay people, you know, there are sure. lay people working on their degrees and, and taking, so it was very, yeah. I mean, I, I think you're always, you know, I think in the church, it looks like historically we kind of swing back and forth between. Sure. Not to get Hegelian here, but I mean, we, you know, there is a little bit of, okay, wow, it was really strict, you know, so let's mm -hmm. make it just like grad school. Well, now we see, okay, well, grad school kind of, maybe we should bring it back a little bit more um, yep. to find a little bit of, of discipline and identity for the guys that are going through yeah. it and make it mean something. And prior, my, my friends were like, we want to come to something. I'm like, well, the first thing that happens of consequence really is my diaconate ordination, right. you know, so Which is wait way five down, years. Yeah. <laughs> And, and then you can come see where I'm at. And, right. um, 
but yeah, I mean, because if you if if we had the tonsure and then we had the minor orders, you know, you could you would be a cleric and you would right. wear a cassock and wear yep. the collar, and it wouldn't be just sort of in anticipation of an event, right? You, right. I mean, in effect, we're operating as if there were minor orders, even though there aren't minor orders. So let's just and have, as you know, I mean, there's there's great stuff out there. It's a, a reporter, I think, for the Washington Post, dressed up as a priest and and for a day, and he just said it was this the most unreal thing. I mean, that's great formation. Wearing this collar, wow. I mean, it is. You, it's, every day is a story, you know, an yeah. interesting, fascinating adventure of what people say to you and and all that kind of stuff. So it would be great to get guys. I think, you know, yeah, absolutely. You make great, great points. Yeah. Yeah. So what, so we've talked about priests, we've talked about seminarians, lay people. What yep. is the message for lay people? I, on this channel, on YouTube, on iTunes, I've been basically the message of Fatima. Right. You have to do personal sacrifice, personal penances. Mm-hmm. Chiefly, we need to pray the rosary. Right. We need to be devoted to the sacraments. We cannot be disillusioned by the hierarchy because the church is not the hierarchy. The church is the body of Christ, right. Christ the head, and all the baptized. Right. So these are the things that I've been repeating over and over and just saying, hey, yeah. this year, 2019, is a call to new holiness. Read the Bible this year, the whole thing. Right. You know, start reading the Summa Theologiae. Get, this is battle. Right. You can't just right. sit around and, and, and look at your gun. You need to polish your gun and practice with it. You need to get in into the weapons of traditional Catholic piety. What would you say as a priest? Um, yeah, thanks. Thank, I think that's a great question. And I, one of the things that I think you've probably heard this too, right? Because you're doing all these great videos, podcasts, you know, on Vegano and, 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 and Fatima and stuff. And so it's kind of, you're, you're kind of continuing the conversation. I hear from people, you know, I preached probably out of the eight weeks following my character probably seven of the weeks were related to the scandal. We moved through the stages of grief. I was angry <laughs> and, and my people were angry. And then it was like, what are we going to do? You know? And, and, and I just want to say thank you for that. Cause so many people in the comments on this channel say, my priest says nothing. I went to church on Sunday. It was nothing. Next Sunday, nothing just ignored. And this is the number one pastoral issue. So it's, it's, I'm glad that you're talking crisis. about it. It's, I mean, it's the biggest crisis in the history of the church. I, uh, I, I don't know how, you know, yeah, I, I don't know how you don't talk about it, and and, and it, but it's, to to keep that point going too, I think you've probably heard it. I know I've heard it too. It's like, hey, Father, are you going to move on from this? You know, like kind of they were kind of like, okay, it's run its news cycle. McCarrick was bad. People got hurt in Pennsylvania. They don't say it that way, but that, you know, they're essentially kind of like, and I, I even see stuff on Facebook if I share something or Twitter. You know, people will be like. Are you do you you know are you going to talk about anything else new you know and I'm like the interesting thing about that for me and this is this is getting to your question about the laity is I think some people are saying well I've had my I've moved through my stages and I'm good to go now and so I kind of want to move on and and my thing is that's wrong that's selfish and that's narcissistic because essentially what they're saying is look I'm good now so since I'm good the church is good and you can stop talking about it and you can move on. I mean, like, that's right. insane, right? Like just because you've talked about it or, you know, it's been on the Washington post and the New York times and now it's not like, what is that? Has it been fixed? You know, that, that's the question. Has the problem that caused this been fixed? And the answer to that is there's nothing that's been done. Absolutely nothing. nothing Look at the yet. USCCB meeting. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. And, and, and so as a lay person, my thing is, is keep fighting. And don't just say, well, because I'm kind of tired of fighting, I, now I'm gonna, we're done. Like, this is, th- there's been nothing that's been done yet to fix this, right? And, and I think the other thing is, so A, keep going, and don't just use your own tiredness to decide when you're going to stop. Um, the, the other thing that I would say is that demand transparency, demand accountability of your bishops of everyone, you, you know, you can do that. Right. And, and, and you can, you know, I, I just, I can't even fathom as a father, as a Bishop or a Cardinal coming out and, and treating this via press releases. Right. Like I, I just cannot. It's insane. It's unreal. It's like and how so, 1989 are you? Right. That you're we are putting deeply out- saddened by the fact that people have blown their brains out over right. sexually being sexually harassed by pre- who, who, who talks about who does that? that? Yeah. Press release, yeah, press release or, you know, and you, so demand, I think from the church 
from your leaders, from the, from the leaders of the church and everybody, accountability, uh, where is that money going? And, and, and who was, who, which bishops knew about this? Mm-hmm. And don't tell me that the guys, you know, that this whole thing with like the Vatican saying, you know, we're going to go down and, uh, you know, we're going to investigate McCarrick himself. Well, the reason McCarrick's in this situation is because of the guys that over there. So, you know, hey, don't worry, we're going to go down to the archives and we're going to do our own investigation right. of ourselves. Like, that's laughable. Yeah, you it know? Is. So a- as the lay people, you can just, you, you need to, um, we're not happy. We're not satisfied. We're going to keep asking for accountability and transparency, and and we're not going to just go away. That that's the normal thing, right? Like if you're a, if you're a or a corporation, if you're Pepsi or whatever, and you have a bad news day, everyone tells you just write it out, right? As a corporation, right. just just kind of it'll yeah. go away because people get tired, and you'll have the the awful day on Twitter. Well, in this, I mean, I think some people are telling those who are in the wrong in the church the same thing. And we as the, lay, the laity and, and, and the priests and everybody else need to say, uh, we ain't going anywhere. Yeah. And this is a war. And, and you don't, you know, so that would be my main thing to the lady, in addition to what you said with all of the spiritual exercises, the fastings, the Exodus 90, you know, the offering up of penances and rosaries mm-hmm. for all of this and making ourselves saints. Um, but I, you know, we do want to be, we want to caution. I know I'm sure you've heard it too. Some people are like, well, all I'm going to do is worry about me. You know, all I'm going to do is worry about becoming a saint. Well, that's not it either. You know, you have to do both. I think you have to worry about and and make it a spiritual battle for yourself, but then also say, and also I'm going to raise holy, literally holy hell. Uh, and, and because I'm, I have just, my voice is just as important as Cardinal McCarrick's voice was when he was at the height of his power, because mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a person that's called to be a saint as he was too. Yes. And it, it, it's, uh, that those, so those would be the main things, I guess. Yeah. I get the sense that it, some things have died down like the dubia. Yeah. But I, I think when it comes to the American problem and McCarrick and USCCP, I, as of today, I think it, the movement is much stronger than it was a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. Yes, I think in the secular press, they kind of go through their news cycles. But lay people, people talking in the narthex, you know, people talking at coffee afterwards, people talking on Twitter or Facebook, whatever, it's getting really loud. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And it, and it was just, it's, it's yeah, it's not, I think there's certainly a... Uh, a, a, a commentariat, you know, a, a Catholic, um, a good, solid community of, of faithful people who are keeping the fire burning. And it, yeah. and it, and it seemed, I think that they're coming to grips with those who are in the wrong here mm-hmm. are coming to grips with the fact that this isn't going away. Um, and that it's not the same as Pepsi having a bad day. Like right. this is, yeah. Well, in 2002 and in, in previous times, there was not social media. There was no way for you and me, if we didn't work for CNN or NBC, to keep a fire going. But there right. are literally tens of thousands of lay people who are commenting every single day on Facebook and Twitter, sharing stories, sharing comments, sharing what they know. Right calling people I, accountable. It's, I mean, I imagine if, if you are compromised and you're at the top, it's a scary moment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's no pitchforks, but there's tweets. Right. Yep. You go, yeah. go to the USCCB and read the comments of people underneath their posts. Go to uh, any of the leading cardinals or any, right. anyone who's compromised. Go to their tweets and look at the comments they're getting. Right. It's crazy. It's, it's, yeah, it's very, very direct. I, I think of the social media as kind of like it's people talk about the Benedict option, you know, and I, I, I feel like this is like we're finding we're finding a faithful community of people who, who believe in the, the, the church is kind of networking and and healing itself almost, you yeah. know, through this ability to connect with other people who are on board. And, yeah, I can't imagine that that's, you know, these these scandals in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whenever it was, you know. There was no way for anybody to mount the resistance. Well, now there yeah. is, and we're all we're doing it. And and I think I would just tell the lay people, yeah, keep it up. You know, keep uh, yeah. join the fight if you're not in it. You know, and it'll be interesting to see to me. You know, too, just real quick. But I, I, I'm curious to see what all the diocesan appeals and things will be like this year. 
um, when, when those are happen. almost all uh, those in the end of the year. When, when are they I, timed? I just know I, locally. I, I think but, they're all over the place. Okay. Um, I, I know ours are, ours is in the fall, but I know a lot. It sounds like do it in the spring. Mm-hmm. Some diocese will tell your parish you have a goal of thirty thousand, and if you don't get it, we're taking it out of your account. Right. You know, so some dioceses won't feel the burn, um, but I think the dioceses that do, I think that'll be a wake up call when when everybody, you know, kind of realizes, oh, yeah, it's at this level. I've I've heard generally across the country parishes and dioceses are down 20 percent is what i've heard mm-hmm. it's kind of a rough yeah. number yeah so, i don't know yeah, if it's, it's more or less giving. yeah yeah well uh father thank you so much uh I, i've yeah. learned a lot from you just following you on social media and um and uh we reached out to one another and i'm glad we did hopefully we can do some more videos together and and i i like your balanced measured uh not rules but ideas concepts on holding the clergy accountable. And I, again, like I, it, what's great about it is it doesn't require a motu proprio, doesn't right. require a new code of canon law. Yeah. It just requires bishops to be fathers, not right. CEOs. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, if, if I find that, you know, one of my teenagers is, you know, making a bad grade or doing something wrong, they get suspended. Right. It's called being grounded. Right. I'm, I'm restricting your exterior activity in the world so I can figure out what's going on or till we can fix it or get some kind of a, you know, correction in your life. Right. That's what a dad does. Right. It's called grounding. Maybe suspension on Davina is grounded. You're grounded. Yeah. Right. Until we can either figure it out or we figure out that you're a scoundrel and then you're. And then you're done, done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, well, thanks for all you guys are doing. I mean, it's just been, it's been awesome following you and. And um, I know we follow each other for many years, but this is, like you said, has brought a lot of people together that maybe just paid attention to each other from a distance. I think there's a real Catholic family kind of being formed in the midst of all mm-hmm. this and um, the remnant, I guess, <laughs> whatever yeah. word you want to use. Right. But uh, yeah, just keep up the great work. Thanks for all you're doing as a faithful lay person. Well, thank you, Father Hallwell. Uh, you, when I have a priest, I love a, a, a final prayer or a blessing. So if you're open for that, I, I think that'd be great. Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Heavenly Father, well, we'll do the sign of the cross. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect a little bit and to share in this conversation. And we pray that it might bear fruit in the lives of the church and, uh, and in our own lives and the lives of all those who listen. May we continue to draw closer to you and to uh, through through the intercession and, and prayers of, of our Blessed Mother as well. And uh, yeah, just continue to watch over us and bless us this day and always. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless. Thank you, Father John Hallwell. And uh, if you like this channel, please subscribe and like, and we'll see you in the videos to come. Godspeed. God bless. Bye.